By now, most of you have heard about the devastating earthquakes affecting Syria and Turkey. Well, an operator from Turkey reached out on Twitter asking about the best radio for such a disaster scenario. It's not an easy question to answer, but I thought we could go through some of the radios we've seen on the channel and help him make an educated choice. So today, choosing the best radio for off-grid survival. Let's get started. Okay, let's start this discussion this way. Anyone telling us that any particular radio is the right one or the best one for a disaster scenario probably has absolutely no idea what they're talking about. Now, this isn't me just being my normal grumpy self. There's actually a point to it. Our radios should meet our survival requirements. Now, that's important because just because some guy on the Internet says a particular radio is the best one he's ever had, uh, it doesn't mean that that's the best radio for you. Hell, it might even mean that that's the only radio that guys ever had. It doesn't mean it's a bad radio. We just need to validate what people are saying. Now, in order to remove all of the moving targets and try to answer this question for this operator, we need to make some assumptions. Now, I'm going to assume we're talking about HF communications. I'm going to assume data is on the table. I'm going to assume some voice communications are on the table. And I'm going to assume we need to do all of these communications off-grid with our own power. Now, most of the radios we've seen on the channel should be able to achieve these goals. These goals aren't difficult, but um, each radio has unique qualities, making it harder or easier to achieve the goals we've laid out. Now, in my personal opinion, every survival HF radio or every HF radio we're using for survival and preparedness should have a few common features. I'd like to see a radio with low current consumption. Low current consumption is important because it also affects the size of the batteries we need. Higher current consumption, larger batteries. This is true for transmit and receive. Current consumption also affects our operating time, so keep that in mind. I'd like to see a radio with at least 10 watts of output. Not that we're going to use it, but uh, that we have it there if we need it. Now let's take a moment to talk about band coverage. In the best case scenario, I'd like to see you at the radio with 160 meters through 70 centimeters. In the worst case, 80 meters through 10 meters. Ultimately, the band coverage is entirely up to you and your requirements. I'd like to see a radio with built-in audio interface, and if it doesn't have it, then simple facilities to allow us to add one. I'd like to see our radios with an internal battery and fast charging. It shouldn't take 8 or 10 or 16 hours to recharge the internal battery. Moreover, we shouldn't need to remove the battery from the enclosure to charge it. Finally, a large daylight readable display. Displays have come a long way these days, and we've seen with the 705 and the TX500 that you don't need to pull a lot of current in order to have a good visible screen. Now, some of you may be thinking I left out a few things, particularly an antenna tuner, but if you watched my last video, Man Portable HF Antenna Strategy, you'll know that there are lots of antennas available for us which omit the need for an internal antenna tuner. This way we can save some money. Of course, if the radio has it, great. Uh, if it doesn't, we don't have to spend the money. Now let's take a moment to talk about the mission. I mean, what we're actually going to do with the radio. Now normally when people are talking about emergency communications on their channels or their blogs, more often than not they're talking about disaster relief. Aries type emergency communications. That's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here is getting in touch with loved ones, friends, family, group members when the grid is down. This is usually before disaster relief arrives on the scene to start getting things back in order. Now, ham radio operators and groups like Aries and so on have an absolutely brilliant reputation for disaster relief. However, most of you watching this channel are probably not going to wait around for the government to come and save you. I guess that's clear. With that said, there's several radios we've seen on the channel which kind of fit the bill for a survival radio. 
There's the Zygu G90, the Zygu X6100, the Yezu FT817ND, or 818, but that's a special case. Uh, the ICOM IC705, and of course, the uh, Discovery TX500. Undoubtedly, the very first thing you'll notice about my list is that for the most part, these are QRP or low power radios. There is a reason for that. And most ham radio operators are in it for DXing or contesting. Most of the time, they're thinking in terms of uh, efficiency and output power. They can't make the contact, of course, they'll try again later, or in the worst case scenario, they'll increase the power so they can make it over the pileup. When we have a preparedness mentality, it kind of mimics what we've learned from military communications. 20 to 30 watts is probably the most you'll ever need when trying to communicate over HF. Of course, we need to be clever about it. We're not going to try to make a contact with our group members on a contest weekend on 20 meters. That's just ridiculous. But we can take advantage of the work bands, 60 meters, 30 meters, 17 meters, in order to get those signals through. Now, before we go on to the pros and cons of each radio, let's take a moment to talk about why I've chosen these QRPO low power radios. In a disaster scenario, of course, we never know that we can stay in a fixed location. In the case of Turkey, perhaps the building has collapsed, yeah? You have your equipment with you, but uh, you have actually no place to operate. You're going to operate from wherever you actually end up, your physical location. So carrying, for example, an ICOM IC7300 or a Yezu 991 Alpha or 710, it's a no-go. You don't know that you're going to have a vehicle. You don't know that you're going to have a fixed location to operate from. You need something small and man-portable in order to deploy it when and where you can. I can assure you with 100% certainty, if you're trying to carry an ICOM IC7300 or similar radio around in a disaster, you're going to leave it behind. It's just too big and requires too many resources to properly field expediently. With that said, if you need to operate QRO or with higher power on HF, get yourself a small amplifier to augment your portable radio. It's still going to be lighter and more efficient than a QRO radio like the 7300, the 991 Alpha, and so on. So let's go through the pros and cons of each of the radios on my list. Now, keep in mind, I don't have the true SDX or any of the Elecraft radios, so... I'm going to omit those. It doesn't mean they're uh, they're not valid radios, but uh, maybe Gil, the radio prepper, might do a video on the uh, KX2, for example, for radio survival. But for now, let's start with the Zygu G90. Now, the Zygu G90 is our budget pick. Yeah, it's an HF radio operating from 0.5 megahertz up to 30 megahertz. There's no VHF on this radio. Now, with that said, the G90 has built-in DSP, so there's no fumbling around or trying to find filters that don't exist. And it has a built-in antenna tuner, which is a good bet if that's important to you. The G90 also has a color display, which can be disabled to save on current consumption uh, when you don't need to see the screen. Now, regarding data modes, the G90 doesn't have an internal audio interface. That's okay, though, because it supplies a connector on the back of the radio so we can install a digirig. The cons of the G90 are the current consumption. If we think about it, that's beyond the top end of what we're hoping for. However, the G90 has 20 watts of output. So what we lose on receive current consumption, we actually gain on output power. Regarding internal power, the G90 does not have an internal battery pack. However... There's a battery pack I did late last year on the channel called the Pocket Portable Solar Generator. This will power the G90 sufficiently for hours upon hours at a time. The G90 is definitely one I'd take a look at if you're on a budget. Just keep in mind you'll have to add a DigiRig audio interface if you want to do data modes. And of course, uh, for local communications, you'll need to add yourself a handheld radio. Next up, the Zygu X6100. Now, the 6100 is a step up from the G90. It's also a step up in price, but uh, it comes with additional features the G90 doesn't have, like built-in audio interface, an even larger color display, antenna toner, 
internal battery. Now, it truly is a pocket portable rig. Now, the current consumption is quite reasonable on the X6100. It's high when it's charging the internal battery, but, uh, but it's reasonable when the internal battery is fully charged and you're just running the radio. Now, I'm not sure if that means the charging rate for the internal battery was set too high at the factory, or if that's the fast charging we've actually been asking for. Either way, it doesn't matter, especially if we're powering it from solar power. With that said, we really can consider the X6100 as a shack in the box. It does everything. Everything is included. You may want to buy yourself a different microphone because that's one of the cons. The microphone is crap. The radio is excellent. Now, as far as the cons go, the firmware is the con, which is always true for Zygu radios. Uh, when they are first released, the firmware is absolutely abysmal. Later on, they tend to do a very good job of updating the firmware. Now, there is a Russian operator who has uh, hacked somehow the X6100 and done a much better firmware version than Zygu has itself. You might want to take a look at that. You'll find videos on it on YouTube. Now, like the G90, the X6100 isn't a perfect radio, but it's an awesome radio. It's small, compact, lightweight. You can charge it up with a DC power supply. Would I recommend it? Absolutely. I think it's a brilliant radio, which can only get better. Next on my list of radios is the Yaesu FT817 and 818. From this point forward, we'll just call it the 81X and referring to both models in the series. <laughs> Where do I start with the 81X? It's a small radio. DC to daylight, 160 meters up to uh, 70 centimeters all mode. In that way, it's absolutely incredible. Filters are incredibly difficult to find for that radio. If you find the filters, and the filters are important to you, you might want to try to find the filter first and then uh, pick up the radio if you can find the radio. Internal batteries are AA or the Yaesu AA battery pack. Uh, Runtime is just realistically at 5 watts a couple of hours. On the 818, it's a 6 watts output, but the 1 watt really doesn't make any difference in the field. It's small, it's lightweight. If you use resonant antenna, you don't need to uh, have a tuner or anything like that. The tuner is almost bigger than the, uh, than the radio, unless you uh, get the Elecraft T1 tuner, which is what I did for my uh, 81X. Internal batteries take a very long time to charge. There is no fast charging capability. It seems like when the radio was designed, uh, very little thought was going into how the radio would be charged and if you were using it constantly rather than uh, just periodically here and there for a lunchtime activation. If you want to do data modes, you'll definitely need to get yourself a diggy rig. The 81X series has a connector on the back for cat control and data, so the digi rig is the perfect uh, utility for that. Current consumption isn't great, but it's not bad either. It's uh, reasonable for the uh, era which that radio was designed. With today's modern batteries, lithium and lithium iron phosphate, um, it'll run pretty well on a small battery pack like the uh, pocket portable solar generator. So no issues there. So the question becomes, would I recommend it? Well, it's a tough question. Uh, let's put it this way. An experienced operator who knows what he or she is doing could do wonders as I have done for 20 years with the Yaesu FT81X. A novice operator or someone just coming into the HF radio might be very frustrated with the radio. Honestly, I would choose something like the X6100 or the G90, um, or if uh, money was no object, one of the last two radios that I'm going to talk about. But you need to know all the quirks of the 818 or 817 so that you can field it effectively. Now, honestly, guys, that was a very difficult segment to make. People keep accusing me of bashing the 817 or 818, but uh, I love that radio. I still have one and I wouldn't sell it. If you're just doing voice and CW, the 817 or 818 is a great radio. Yeah, especially if you can find the filters. But if you want to do a lot of things, if you want to grow with the radio, it's going to get expensive. You're going to start adding all sorts of things that you could get if you simply chose another radio in the first place. 
Anyway, I leave it up to you guys. Now, next on my list is the Lab 599 Discovery TX500. Now, before we get started, let's put aside all of the political nonsense, all the brouhaha, and just talk about how this radio can help us as a potential survival radio. Now, the TX500 is the only rugged amateur radio out of the bunch. It's rugged, it's weatherproof, and it's machined from a single block of aluminum. If you had to, you could pick it up, use it as a hammer, get the job done, and go back to operating the radio like there was no tomorrow. It's that rugged. Now, normally, the ruggedness would come at the expense of its weight, but the design is extremely efficient, and the weight doesn't suffer. The TX500 is also incredibly efficient. In fact, it's more efficient than the Elecraft series of radio who set the efficiency standard. So easy charging and long operating times from your chosen battery pack are definitely a welcome feature. And many of the radios claiming low current consumption do so by turning off the backlight or switching off certain features on the radio. There's no trickery or nonsense with the TX500. The current consumption is what it is. And it's measured in the worst case scenario. It only gets better from there if you start shutting off features. Now the TX500 doesn't have a battery pack yet, but it does have a modular interface for a battery pack, which is incoming. There's actually two battery packs incoming, one from uh, Lab 599 itself and another from DIY 599. They are also making a PA500 amplifier for the TX500, but I digress. The point is, you can use any battery pack you'd like for the TX500 or get one of the modular battery packs available for it. Now, one of the cons of the TX500 is it lacks an internal audio interface. Actually, unless you count an antenna tuner, the internal audio interface is the only thing missing from this radio. So you're going to have to get yourself a digirig, which isn't a bad thing, but uh, it does add cables to the radio. Now, as far as band coverage, 0.5 megahertz up to 56 megahertz. Six meters is great. It's an awesome preparedness band for local communications, especially because most people are using two meters and 70 centimeters. It's also a 10 watt radio. 10 watts output on HF, NVIS, regional communications. That's more than enough. Filters and DSP are already built in, which is amazing. You don't have to go around fumbling for any unobtainium filters like uh, with the Yaesu FT818. So another good thing. Now, if I had to slam this radio for anything, I would say cable management. There's one thing I would do. I would swap the, uh, the cat control port with the mic port. I would change the places on the radio because uh, the data port and the cat control ports are on different sides of the radio. This really makes a cluster bugger. <laughs> This really makes a, a mess in regards to wire management when you're doing data modes. I think operators primarily doing CW or voice modes wouldn't understand this problem, but um, a primarily data mode operator finds it extremely annoying. So, would I recommend this radio? Absolutely, without a second thought. It forces you to change the way we operate or it changes our expectations from traditional radios we find in the amateur radio community. And in fact, I think the unconventional design and ruggedness terrify companies like Elecra. I guess there's really no point in telling you how nice it is having an unconventional option on the table. So now we arrive at the ICOM IC705. And in comparison to the TX500, which I like to equate to a Land Rover Defender, the ICOM IC705 is more like a Bugatti Veyron. And just like the TX500, the IC705 was designed with purpose. Purpose being, give the portable operator every single tool they could possibly need in the field. To be fair though, it's easier to tell you what the ICOM IC705 doesn't have rather than to tell you what it does. Well, it doesn't have an antenna tuner, but everything else you could possibly want is built into this radio. With the ICOM IC705, we have 160 meters through 70 centimeters. We have filters and DSP built in, noise reduction, notch circuit built in, 
There's even a built-in GPS we can use for positioning or managing the time on our tablets and laptops. We can even use the inbuilt GPS on the 705 to share our location with other GPS-enabled D-Star radios. Now, if you're primarily a data modes operator, the IC705 is probably going to be your dream radio. It's got built-in audio interface which can be accessed either wirelessly or with a single wire interface between your tablet, laptop, and the radio. Now regarding efficiency, just like the TX500, the IC705 is efficient on both transmit and receive. Receive current is in the same class as the TX500 and the Yellowcraft radios, just above, even with all of the advanced features enabled. It's a very efficient radio. Now, the 705 also has a large touchscreen display. It's absolutely magnificent, it's easy to read, and it's daylight readable. Now, you'll have to take care about that display. I use the POV mounts cage to protect the radio and the polycarbonate cover to protect the screen during transit. You might consider doing the same thing. So, would I recommend the 705? Well, absolutely, but let me explain why. I'm a data modes operator. And as a data modes operator, the 705 is actually the epitome of everything I want in a radio. Now beyond data mode operations, the weak signal work with this radio is absolutely magnificent. I can say the same thing about the TX500. Now just keep this in mind. Like the Elecraft radios, the IC705 isn't the most rugged radio. Definitely nowhere near the TX500. So you'll need to add some body armor to the radio to prevent any damage to the body or the screen. Now, before we shut down with the 705, let's talk a little bit about the cons. There are three. Firstly, the 705 has a micro USB connector for charging and data mode communications. If you use the USB charging while you're doing data modes, you'll get noise from the charging circuit. So you'll have to disable the charging over the USB port while you're operating with data modes using the USB cable. Thankfully, the radio is wireless and you have the choice of disabling or enabling charging over USB, so there are options. Secondly, the ICOM IC705 has an internal battery. The battery is absolutely magnificent and it's the same battery that they use for ICOM HTs. The disappointing part is the radio only puts out 5 watts when it's using the internal battery. Although that battery can definitely put out enough power and amps to give the radio 10 watts. It's actually only about 3 amps on 10 watts, so that's kind of a bummer. It does mean we'll have to use an external power supply if we want to get the full 10 watts out of the radio. Now the last con is about the internal GPS on the 705. The GPS is magnificent, it's sensitive, I love it. However, when I'm using my Microsoft Surface or some other laptop or tablet with the 705, if I want to get that GPS data to the laptop or tablet, I can't do it over its wireless COM ports. I need to use a physical USB cable to get that data from the GPS on the 705 into my tablet or laptop. I'm really not sure what's going on with that, but it is what it is. We can't change it. Maybe ICOM can, but I certainly can't. The 705 is still an absolutely magnificent radio, and I still recommend it. Anyway, that's enough about the 705. Let's start closing down this video. And before we close down this video, there's a few things we have to keep in mind. We often make the mistake of thinking the radio and the antenna are the only parts of our system or go kit that we need for our survival radio. Now, although this really couldn't be further from the truth, we often think about portable power and replenishing our power supplies as an afterthought. When in actuality, we should really be thinking about portable power, we should be thinking about strategies for our laptops or tablets in parallel with our survival radio strategies. For example, quite often I do these videos on portable power and I'll see in the comments someone says, okay, I've got my radio, now I'm just going to grab the old car battery out of the garage to power it. That's not a strategy, that's kind of an afterthought. The point I'm trying to make here is not to bet your lives on an afterthought. Build a strategy, execute the strategy, and put it into action when you need it. Alright guys, the full reviews for all of the radios we've talked about in this video will be linked in the description and possibly also up above. I know many of you like it when I put a blog post together with all the context in one place in a readable format. So time permitting, I will do that as well. All right, guys, let's go ahead and shut it down. 
keep in mind, I don't know everything. I've got some experience. I've done a lot of testing. I've done a lot of field work. But ultimately, this is a community effort. As such, I encourage you to share your knowledge and practical experience in the comments. If we stick together as a community, there's nothing we can't all do together. All right, guys, let me know what you think. The only thing I ask is that you be polite. Now, a special thank you to the YouTube members and patrons and everyone else who is helping to support this channel in whatever way they can. You are truly appreciated. For the rest of you, if you like what I'm doing, if you like the content I'm creating, Please consider leaving me a comment or a super thanks or a thumbs up to let me know. And if it's not too much to ask, please share this video with someone or someplace where other operators might enjoy it. Rock and roll, guys. It's always awesome. Thanks for watching. Ciao.